All right, welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And of course, uh, we are set for our second major conversation right here uh, on the program. Malaki uh, Ogumadu is a lawyer and our guest on this second conversation on the breakfast. Uh, uh, he joins us via video link in Lagos. Uh, Mr. Gumadu, good morning to you and thank you very much for your time. I'm delighted to be with you. Good morning. Uh, Baraka de Sala, they say today. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Most helpful. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the High Court uh, of the Federal Capital Territory on Monday um, refused to vacate an interim order which restrained uh, the National Chairman of the Labour Party, Julius Abure, uh, the National Secretary, Al Haji Farouk Ibrahim, and two others from parading themselves as leaders of that party. Uh, Alex Ejeseme, uh, City Advocate of Nigeria, is cancelled to Comrade Abure. Uh, he had prayed the court to vacate the interim order uh, after another faction had forcefully taken over the party's national secretariat. Uh, the senior lawyer said the division in the party following the interim order had worsened to the extent that four groups in the Emo State chapter of Labour Party held parallel primaries uh, over the weekend. As a result, the council prayed the court to have the matter head speedily. Um, but um, uh, Milord, the Honorable Justice Mwazu, uh, by way of intervention, ordered all parties in the suit to ensure speedy filing of their processes and went to fix April 20 uh, to take all applications in respect of the case. So um, uh, my question to you, um, uh, Malaki Gomado, is what are your thoughts on um, uh, such uh, ex parte applications being granted in, in such a case? Well, let's uh, be clear about this. Ex parte applications and orders are part of our jurisprudence. Uh, in the sense that individual citizens or litigants are at liberty, depending on the circumstances of their case, most often than not, around the question of urgency and the need to preserve the rest, are entitled to approach competent courts to seek, or with an application, an expert application, to seek expertise orders, or what you may call interlocutory orders. Um, what is important in instances like that, as it turned out in this case, is to marshal out compelling and convincing evidence or facts indicating that where the order is refused, there is likely, there is likelihood that one, the rest may be destroyed, two, it will be difficult to preserve the subject matter of the case, and thirdly, it may, we may, the court itself may have found uh, itself in um, a state of helplessness by the time the matter is ripe for hearing. Uh, those, in our words, are like creating special circumstances with a view to persuading the court to accept your application. The flip side of it is that on so many occasions, the headship of the judiciary in Nigeria, particularly this federal high court, had given clear warning and admonition and even restraining orders by way of practice direction that judges must remain very, very, very circumspect. In short, at some point, they were restrained from granting expert orders with respect to political matters. In political matters, clearly, this was one of such political matters. And what did uh, Leonard uh, uh, George presiding? What he carefully did was to say, well, I have had all of what you have canvassed 
as the basis of your application. However, in the interest of justice, and you know we have a very cardinal pillar of justice, which is to the effect that the other party must be heard, resonating with the fundamental right of fair hearing, generally referred to all the other patterns in our Latin marks. So what the judge, let a, try, uh, let a judge say, was, well, in the circumstance of your matter, put the respondents on notice. Put the defendants on notice and come back on so so and so day, just so that this same matter which you have brought before me will be dealt with holistically, having both parties in, uh, in court. Um, you, you could say that part of the contention of the learned senior advocate was that what had happened, there were supervening circumstances, particularly in the part that now justifies an ex parte application. And for which reason, it was therefore very important that first being an interim order, an interim order is not supposed to last in perpetuity. And that by a fluxion of time, the learned trial judge uh, ought to vacate, set aside the subsisting order, directing that uh, the chairman, or the national chairman of the Labour Party, stopped parading. So these were the background. And I have given my take about it. One, it is not an abnormality, it is indeed a crucial aspect of uh, jurisprudence. Uh, the Nigerian jurisprudence. And it's, it's, it's in every other jurisdiction. The whole essence of it is to uh, be able, in the circumstances of urgency and emergency, to preserve the rights, which is the subject matter of the matter, with a view to dealing with that exigency of that moment, uh, just so that by the time the matter is uh, uh, brought on notice, uh, uh, you wouldn't have uh, uh, the rest, the subject matter of the matter that wouldn't have been destroyed, in which case there would not be anything to litigate upon uh, any longer. That, that, that is settled. What is not settled is what has turned out in our own client in our own circumstance that appears like an abuse of those interim orders. In short, what used to obtain is that litigants, politicians in particular, will nudge the lawyers, urge them to seek those interim orders, and once they get it, they go to sleep. Most of them are not. These orders are obtained you know, on the eve of very important statutory meetings, statutory convention, okay. statutory uh, uh, just just so, just so we are clear, um, Mr. Gumado, yeah. just so we are clear, how long is this interim order supposed to last by law? Yes. Well, there is very, very simple answer to that. Uh, interim orders in the first instance is supposed to last for 14 days. Two weeks. Now, by the end of that 14 days, the party who has sought the order where he so wishes to have it extended can also approach the same point, conversing reasons why the order should be extended knowing that by the fluxion of time, by the nature of the order itself, it elapses at the end of... Uh, it's an interim order. In some other cases, depending on the approach that you have adopted, you could have an application for interlocutory, that is what we call interlocutory orders. You could seek an order, an interim order pending the interlocutory application, that interlocutory application is usually designed to sustain the same order per 
pending the here the determination of the whole matter. So, in the interim, for the purpose of the exigency of the time, I urge the court, please grant me this order, restraining this of uh, uh, you know A B C for the purpose of this on the basis of so and so. That order is granted. In, at the same time, you may have in your main suit also uh, find another uh, application seeking interlocutory order. That one, if granted, lasts pending the determination of the matter. So that if it takes 12 years, 4 years, 2 years, 8 months, you are no longer caught by the seven, uh, 14 days uh, uh, time frame. Okay, well, well, well sorry, is, sorry to interrupt. But you know, you know it's... Um it, 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 it's, it's, uh, you, you said it before, you talked about um, the principle of fair hearing, and some lawyers have said that granting of these uh, in, you know, interlocutory uh, orders, or ex parte orders, um, run contrary to that principle of fair hearing. But we've seen over the years that um, uh, chief judges or judges of, um, yeah, chief judges of, and even judges uh, and lawyers have talked about, you know, taking away this, this, this aspect of the jurisprudence from political cases. You know, for instance, in 2018, the chief judge of the Federal High Court at the time, like Justice Abdul Kafarati, stopped judges from issuing ex parte orders in political cases. In fact, some juries uh, were asking or urging sanctions against lawyers uh, and judges mm -hmm. for issuing uh, frivolous ex parte uh, uh, orders. We go to um, uh, 2019. 19, no, sorry, to 2020, where Justice uh, John Soho, of the, the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, um, again, Federal High Court, warned judges to stop granting ex parte orders in political matters. That's two su su successive Chief Justices or Chief Judges of the Federal High Court. You know. And then the CJN uh, in 2021, you know, have waged a war. It was said to have waged a relentless, relentless war against uh, reckless ex parte orders. So, I don't know where we're going to go from here. And it reminds me, sir, of um, uh, Walter Nogan's um, uh, attempt to, to you know, take away this thing called technicality from uh, uh, judging matters of a political nature, which the judges have continued to use. But what are your thoughts on this attempt by um, Labour Party's um, uh, uh, lawyer, or Abure's lawyer, rather, um, to, to get the court to vacate the interim order for now? And then what the, the, the judge, um, the honorable judge, said regarding that. Um, I mean, we're not going to, to say that the judge doesn't know what he's doing, but what are your thoughts on that attempt to vacate the interim order? Um, and, of course, the judge is saying that they should file uh, their processes speedily. So what, what's at play here? Well, it's almost like the first question. But I, I need to thank you for uh, putting dates and the names to do that. I had mentioned that earlier, that uh, the headship of the judiciary, no less the Federal High Court, had on so many occasions, you know, admonished judges uh, to, re to re restrain themselves, so to refrain from issuing expertise orders, particularly with respect to political matters. Uh, and, and if I may take it a bit uh, further, you know, part of it is that you don't appeal against expert elders. It's one of the exceptions. You have a right of appeal constitutionally. You, you have also a right to proceed on appeal with the leave of, of the court, either of the lower court or the court of law. But if the order is with respect to expert elders, you cannot appeal. It's almost like Appealing against declaratory orders. There's nothing to, there's nothing to, uh, I mean, seeking uh, leave to, um, to, to stay the execution of declaratory order. It doesn't work. So, now, remaining on your question, it is that the learned senior advocate, in my view, and I have, I've had a few comments uh, on the other, uh, to the contrary, but the learned senior advocate, in my view, and portion to the instruction he may have caused, was within his rights, within his premise and purview and remis, to approach the court. I imagine that it is against the backdrop of these admonitions 
that the, uh, the court, they didn't throw away his application. They said, no, go put the, res the respondents on notice and come back on social media. Within which time, this issue will be trashed out uh, by both parties, by the competing parties. Uh, in other words, what was tactically refused was that scenario by which the learned senior advocate had approached the court to appear all alone in an expertise application and consequently to be able to obtain. Because once the motion is moved, once you allow the application to be moved, you must, you must rule. It could be a bench ruling, it could be a ruling upon a result date. But you must rule. That is, that is in the nature of our practice and jurisprudence. So now your question is my take on all of this. First, within the context of the law, it is legitimate that they approach the court. Also within the context of the law, particularly regarding the inherent jurisdiction, don't forget, these are discretionary powers, injunctions, injunctive orders, whether mandatory or interlocutory or, or whatever, are within what we call the uh, discretionary powers of the court to give. Now, the point, therefore, is that where in circumstances where the court is persuaded that it will, it will serve the interest of justice the more, which is usually the case, to have both parties uh, available to be able to deal with the circumstances of that matter, he proceeds. It is at his discretion, arising or drawing from his inherent jurisdiction to be able to deal, have accepted uh, to uh, deal with the matter. So, having said that, and that is situating within the context of the law, politically, you could see that we're not, we're not sailing smoothly. Uh, in the sense that what has become a very major factor, a defining moment, a change game or game changer was the participation of that political party known as Labour Party. But more importantly, the emergence of the presidential candidate as well as his running mate. Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Gumbano, Mr. Gumbano, just yes. <clears throat> just a moment. Yes. I just want to understand this because we're running out of time. Um, I, I I want to understand the premise under which uh, the courts take their decisions. You know, uh, I am a layman. You are the lawyer, so I don't understand this. Now, if someone comes to the court to get uh, an interim order, as it were, in this in this case, that that is what is happening. Uh, does the court just collect what has been offered to them by this lawyer or this party that is coming for the interim order, or they are at liberty to also make a research to see whether the allegations or whether the reason for applying for this interim order are, are good enough, are strong enough. I, I tell you why I'm asking this. The, um, the, the, the chairman of a Labour Party that has been removed or suspended was suspended if, according to what they are saying, the constitution of Labour Party states that the only person or the only people that can suspend this person of this caliber will have to be the National Executive Council of the party. Clearly, the people who suspended him were not. So if this people, this party coming to get this uh, order came and they were not supposed to do this, is the court not supposed to do its own findings to see whether this is just a frivolous uh, order that is being sought? 
Because if that constitution says that he cannot be removed by the people that came and obtained this interim order, uh, so, and then the court has gone ahead to grant them this order, do, don't explain to us how the court makes its decisions, how they take its decisions. And now they are even preventing um, a, a vacation of that order, or because that's how yeah. I understand it. So how do they make their decisions? Just what they feed them. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a very valid question. And if I may, if I may add to the controversy as it is, I will tell you that they have been opposing orders by courts of coordinate jurisdiction in different judicial divisions. The one in Abuja, restrained. The one in Edo, Benin in particular. Uh, allowed, and then it's refused one more time uh, by the Abuja uh, Abuja uh, Ferrycourt. So I I speak to the controversy that that has capacity to generate in a fragile uh, uh, polity like ours, no less in political environment. But back to your question, you know. I had tried the much I could to describe what an ex parte application is and what an ex parte order also means. What you need to know, in addition to what I had said earlier, regarding the question directly, which is, how do judges come to their conclusions? Do they just grant these orders without, their, without uh, some background checks and research. Oh, well, that would be completely uncharitable if we were to accept that that is how they come to conclusion. Make no mistake about it. It could be true, and of course, evidence about reports are also available, even by judicial panels of inquiry. One headed, to my knowledge, by late uh, Justice Kayo uh, complaining about the problem in the judiciary. But make no mistake about, like I said, the, the Nigerian judiciary, the Nigerian judiciary stands out as one of the most resilient, one of the most formidable. And I've had cause in my little years of practice to even uh, present and papers and uh, engage the Nigerian judiciary at the highest level in terms of giving lectures on areas of experts. And I, I, could, I could relate to the challenges. So I make that point that, yes, uh, perhaps because of the expectation, because of what is expected of the judiciary anywhere in the world within a political formation or entity. So the expectation is very high. And therefore, where you see transgression from one or two, it is as though you have seen a priest of a Catholic church, for instance, uh, committing unpardonable offenses. But your question is direct as to, do they just grant this order? Mm -hmm. And I say, no. Usually, expert applications are constituted by the motion itself. The motion seeks reliefs. Those releases are brilliant. But more importantly, the motion is supported by affidavits. These affidavits are statements of facts in relation to the reliefs being sought, by which the applicant is able or tries to show to the court that given the peculiarities of these facts as I present them, most of them are known. In short, in some cases, you, you find what we call the affidavit of voters. So these facts That's right. yeah, but, but, speaks to the voters yeah. and the need to ensure that if this order is not given in term, it is likely that by the time you put the other party on notice, 
the whole purpose for which you have run to the court would have been defeated. Okay, uh, 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 barrister, sorry to interject. Uh, apologies for that. Um, uh, we just have one final question to ask. And you've already, uh, thankfully, gone ahead to, to address the issue of conflicting uh, uh, orders from uh, <laughs> courts of coordinate jurisdiction, which is quite funny anyway. And um, before you go, the leadership of the Nigerian Labor Congress um, uh, earlier stormed, I think last week or this week, stormed the headquarters of uh, the, the Labor Party. Um, they said they were there to, to fumigate rodents. Um, a veiled reference to the other faction, the Apapa faction of the party who um, had taken over the Labour Party headquarters. Um, do you think this action by the judicial, by the Nigerian Labour Congress, sorry, is it inimical to the, um, the case as far as uh, Labour Party Aburi is concerned? Should they be doing this, going to the headquarters to take it over and to say, uh, in the words of... Um, the chairman of uh, the Nigerian Labour Congre Congress, Comrade Jesse Joshua Jero, um, that Abure is the authentic chairman of the party. Does that work? Well, um, let me, I, I didn't watch that, but I had it. Uh, first, Nigerians should be aware that there's a new sheriff in town as far as the Nigerian Labour Congress is concerned, and that is Comrade Joe Ajero, a, a very a veteran and a very tested comrade in the struggle. Uh, now, the second point is that the Nigerian Labour Congress, as a trade union, is a cardinal uh, part of the Labour Party. In short, you could say that they are the drivers of that Labour Party. Uh, what I take it to be is that there was a solidarity uh, a movement of visit by the leadership of the Congress to the political party, which is the political arm of that uh, uh, platform, by which they have created a huge opportunity for Nigerians who probably are dissatisfied with the political elite to find a platform around which they can congregate and pursue their political aspirations. So they've offered that to the Nigerian people. And, and what the Nigerian people feel about it is what uh, what we have been what have been shown in the last uh, general election, even if they are in court at the moment contesting it. So, um, but as a lawyer and from a Joe Ajero too. I think he's a lawyer too, or at the verge of becoming a lawyer, uh, with due respect. Um, all of us must know that orders of court are orders of court. In fact, section 287, this summer, and subsection 3 of the same section of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, as amended, imposes a duty on every person every authority, every agency, to not only to respect court orders, but to seek to enforce it, to help to enforce it. So that if the Supreme Court gives an order, every other court below the Supreme Court, every authority, every agency of government, every institution becomes obligated to obey that court order. Ditto for the court of appeal and every court below it, and so on and so forth. So the point is clear that, in my view, what I think happened was a political move by a very conscious, and you must give that to labor, you must give that to us, you must give that to some of the civil societies, including the one I have led, the Committee for Defense of Human Rights, which was the second civil society organization uh, after CLO that was formed in 1987. You must give that, that, that consciousness. That consciousness is so deep that they realize at all time, at all material time, that vigilance is the eternal price they must continue to pay for the liberty that they seek, for the freedom that they desire. So you cannot fold your hand and watch as the roof of the building that has taken you 
toils and sweat and pain to build collapses under under your under your under your nose. So I, I take it that what had happened was a solidarity move by an integral aspect of that party, which is the labor movement or labor uh, uh, congress, uh, with a view to uh, identifying with. First of all, observing that this has become a situation, but more importantly, to say that it is a challenge which is in response to the alternative that they are trying to create to the political class. And that all of what has happened could be a direct reaction which is in proportional measure to the kind of attrition that uh, they have introduced into the politics. So but the point must be made rather clearly, and I'm at this point repeating myself, that orders of court must not just be obeyed, must be enforced by every person. Uh, and, and if we take it from there, you're likely going to have a less chaotic society. Because if orders of court are treated with levity, it will mean that we're all looking at the last muscle. Before Thank you very much. Thank you very much Thank for your you. time. Uh, Malaki Gumado, lawyer who joined us from Lagos. Um, uh, we appreciate your, your joining us this morning. Look forward to having you again. Thoroughly enjoyed your analysis. Thank you, Thank you for the opportunity. Baraka Desalu. Same to you. Same to you. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, interesting that the courts are the ones giving, they're saying that, you know, a party chairman cannot parade as, uh, 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 as a party chairman for now. But the same court, not the same court, but still the same you know, legal system is saying that uh, a party cannot remove uh, or suspend its members. I'm talking about Sandy Ano and his running mate versus the PDP yeah. and uh, Sim Fubara, uh, a.k.a. Wiki Kwakashia, <laughs> and his running mate versus the PDP. Because said, no, you can't re remove them, you can't suspend them, nothing. So, so the these are some things, things, things that confuse us, but we'll, we'll get a hang of it as time, as time goes on. All right, we'll take a break. When we come back, uh, we will talk sports. Uh, Yamgo, which football club do you support? I've told you. Super Eagles. Yeah. Fantastic. We'll be right back. <laughs> Stay with awesome. us.